Maria Shemkalian, the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association. And I am very excited today because we have a wonderful guest, David Petrarca, who has done so much in both film, TV, and uh, theater. And uh, you know many shows that David directed. Uh, you, of course, know Game of Thrones, The Man in the High Castle, True Blood, Marco Polo, Jessica Jones, and I can keep on going and going and going. I am saying that last. <laughs> <laughs> But it really is an honor to have you here. And thank you for willing to share words of guidance and help aspiring filmmakers. Hopefully one day, get where you are. Absolutely. So, Happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. Thank you. Uh, of course, our first question is, how did you get started in the industry? Oh, <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a long story. I'll try to make it very short. Um, I think for filmmakers and you know people in and the, in this business, everybody has their own path. I don't think there is kind of a single way that people get into it. For me, I started as an act, I trained, I went to NYU and got my degree in acting and art history. Mm -hmm. Trained with Stella Adler for acting for four years and uh, Jensen who wrote the book on art history. So I'm very blessed to have two amazing, you know, mentor teachers in those two things. So I started as an actor in New York. And I, uh, when I graduated, I started my own theater company and wrote, directed, produced a number of plays with my company there. People saw my work. They asked me to do other plays. I ended up becoming a fellowship for the National Endowment for the Arts, which brought, for, as a young director, which brought me to the Goodman Theater in Chicago. And I was there for 14 years as a resident director where I uh, worked with a ton of writers, helped develop a lot of new plays ended up directing all over the world in theater, uh, premiering plays like Marvin's Room and the David Lindsay Bear plays, Buddy Mears, directing the West End on Broadway and, and a lot of theaters around the world. And then somebody saw my theater work and said, hey, have you ever thought about doing television? And I was like, well, I'm a theater director. I don't want to sully myself with television. And, uh, and they said, well, just come out and come out and look. So I said, okay. So I went out to LA and I observed on a show, this was 1996, so I think I was in my mid-30s. So I'd already had a full career at, you know, as a theater artist. And um, I watched one day on set, I'd never been on a film set, and uh, a director became ill coming up and the producer said, do you wanna direct the next episode? Well, I was like, okay, great. I had to literally, I bought like three books and learning about the line in 360 and, and everything I could glean from a few books, which is obviously only one partial way of learning. Uh, notes. <laughs> yeah, and then I, um, I learned by doing, you know, I ended up on set, I had a fantastic uh, DP on that first show, Michael O'Shea, mm -hmm. uh, who was a wonderful man and really basically said to me, you know, I'm not gonna let you be one of those directors that I have to deal with that doesn't know what they're doing. So I, as a director, would stay at lunch and learn how to operate the camera. I learned how to do figure eights on the wheels. I learned about what a camera does and what lenses do and depth of field. And I was put through my paces through the first DP that I worked with, who I'm really grateful for. That was the beginning of it. And then I ended up doing, uh, a lot of my early work was for the, the um, uh, the WB network when it was around. So I did like tons of Dawson's Creek and Gilmore Girls and Jack and Jill and all those shows. And the great thing about those shows is I basically used it as paid film school. So I would go in and say, I'm going to shoot this whole episode off the Steadicam. And I would learn about Steadicam. And they didn't really care because it was basically kids talking, right? And so it gave it a sense of style anyway. And then I'd be like, I'm going to learn about the Technocrate. And I'd shoot a whole episode off the Technocrate. So I literally used the early part of my career to really learn um, kind of the craft, the craft and the skill set needed to have enough information as a director so that I could communicate with people my ideas more clearly. I've always believed that a director, a real director is somebody who takes an interest in everyone else's department, right? And you don't have to be an expert at it, but you need to learn what skills and are available so that you know how to communicate and also so that you know how to make choices and you also have to learn what is an unrealistic choice to ask a department to make so i you know i'm very curious so i kind of threw myself in and really 
train for a long period of time on, on the WB shows. And then after that, that led to working on network television and, and I know Aaron Sorkin on Studio 60 and that led to higher end network shows. And then I, I was of an age where I kind of was lucky enough to then get into like HBO at the golden era of HBO. And, you know, that was like a dream come true uh, and, and directing Boardwalk Empire and yeah. Hung and True Blood and, and they literally, and, you know, Game of Thrones and they, and, and they just rotated me from show to show for five or six years. And that was amazing because then I was ready for the scale and scope of those kind of premium shows. You know, I think that people underestimate what kind of skill set you really need mm -hmm. to, in order to do a show like Game of Thrones or a show like True Blood or Boardwalk Empire. These are massive shows yeah. uh, done on a massive scale. I mean, on, on you know, Game of Thrones, I shot three different countries, uh, you know, prepped for 22 plus days per episode and shot 25 days on three different, in three different countries. So, you know, with, with a palette as a director where they're like, what do you need? If you can imagine it, you should bring it up and we'll try to make it happen. So that was different than starting on uh, Dawson's Creek, which was a great show and I met amazing people and I'm ever grateful to all of them, Greg Berlanti and the actors on that show. But that was, you know, learning how to translate my theater skills because I knew about story, I knew about acting, I knew about staging for theater. I had to learn about staging with a camera and then learning what film, how, what the differences are. Most people who come from theater end up in half hour sitcom three camera because it, it more closely aligns itself mm -hmm. with the skill set of theater. I was like a film director working in theater. So for me, going to the hour long and the, and the drama was kind of a, and because of the art history and everything else, that all kind of helped, right? Mm -hmm. And it took a while to learn in that transition that film is pieces. And it's a really important lesson for young filmmakers. Mm -hmm. You know, film is pieces. It is not one shot that needs to cover everything and every setup. And, and as a director, you learn in the editing room because once you're there and you start to see, ah, I should have got that. I didn't get that shot. I probably, I didn't even think about it. I didn't think I needed that shot. Or, oh, why did I spend all that time doing a master that I knew I was going to cut into? And then I didn't have time to do the shots I needed to put the whole fabric, you know, together. So I found all of these are learning. You know, I've been blessed that I was allowed the opportunity to learn. I was allowed the opportunity to make mistakes and to learn from my mistakes. And, you know, I would say like for a young filmmaker, the most important, a couple important things. One, I'm going off my bio now, sorry, if that's okay. That's okay. Um, some <laughs> of learning the, from every sentence. So. No, 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 no. Um, so I think that um, it's really important to, um, Understand the role of the director is not to dictate, mm -hmm. but it is to, I like to say for me, I'm like a spaghetti colander, <laughs> right? And like everybody throws their ideas into the spaghetti colander, but I get to decide which things fall through the holes at the bottom. I don't have to have every idea. I have to have a point of view. And a lot of what I see lately is filmmaking with no point of view. You know, people don't ask the questions about filmmaking that they used to ask. If you watch great movies, which is, I mostly watch old movies, right? I don't really, but, and new movies. I don't watch a ton of television, even though I work in television, because I feel like when you watch great filmmakers and great films, they work because they have such a strong point of view. And I don't mean style, that's different. I mean, point of view, like whose scene is this scene? Therefore, where am I placing the camera? What I, so what you get nowadays, and I think what separates real filmmaking talent and curiosity as a filmmaker versus mediocrity is the mediocre filmmaker collects footage. Mm -hmm. They're not a director, they're a footage collector. They shoot every angle they can think of, four directions, every scene, and then the editor makes the movie. Well, that's not really directing. 
directing is saying, I know how to realize this scene is, is actually being told from the gardener's point of view, who doesn't even have dialogue. And it's an overheard scene and it requires that shot and maybe two pieces of coverage. And you make a stronger, bolder statement as a filmmaker. Because if you don't, directing ultimately is having a point of view. Mm -hmm. And that means you have to have a point of view in your life. That means you have to go out and live. That means you have to be political and social and funny and all those things you need to be exposed to and travel and different cultures. You want to formulate who you are as a person and find an organic way for who you are as a person to inform what makes you unique as a director. I love it. That was so moving. And well, that's so true that you, you have to acknowledge who you are to bring across your vision. It's true. Otherwise, it's, it's, all, it's all you have. Yeah. Otherwise, you're a faker. Yeah. Otherwise, you're faking it. And, and, you know, it's really about being, if the camera is about being brutally honest, mm -hmm. which it is, yeah. it sees everything. It knows when an actor is inhabiting the role and it knows when an actor isn't. It knows, you know, like, so you have to bring the same kind of honesty. And I'd say the other big skill set is your job on set. You know, you do all your prep, you do all your prep and you kind of figure it all out in order to be totally free on set, to see what's happening in front of you, not to execute your homework. If you execute your homework and you imagined Abbott and Costello in the scene, and you have Meryl Streep in the scene, you better see what Meryl Streep is doing. And you better take advantage of what Meryl Streep is giving you and not say, hey, Meryl Streep, can you be like Abbott and Costello? Because it's not going to work. And it's going to create tension. And you're not going to have the better movie. So there's the, there's the movie that, you know, and I'm not, a, I'm not a writer. I work with writers. So it's a little different for writer directors. So, you know, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. There's the movie that's written or that you write. There's the movie that you prep. There's the movie that you shoot. And there's, then there's the movie that you edit. There are four different movies you're making. It's not one. And this tightness, fear, is what makes directors kind of tend to try to um, make one movie. Mm -hmm. The one they had in their head that they imagined when they were alone in their room and they saw every moment crystal clear. It's like, that's your prep. Yeah. So, you know, you, you're, you're not ultimately in control of everything. And ultimately, all you can do is set uh, lightning rods in the ground mm -hmm. and hope that lightning strikes. But you can't make lightning strike. So you need to, and you need to be flexible enough on the day that like, uh oh, the storm didn't come and didn't hit my lightning rod. But that's interesting over there, the way the light's coming through, you know, hitting the, the field and, and throwing that shadow right where she's standing. That's kind of interesting. I have this strong contrast of her in the shadow and the other character in the light. And maybe that's interesting and helps reveal drama in a way that you could have never prepped when you were sitting in your room. So, you know, and, and I say that as somebody humbly who spent years planning everything in my script and then trying to execute it and I'm speaking from my own growth and, 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 and I, I don't want to call them errors because it's part of the process of growing, right? And hopefully you're surrounded with people that allow you that um, freedom and, and, and always, you know, you always have to remember people like a writer gets to sit in their room and if they don't like the scene, they throw it out and they rewrite it. They're still by themselves. Yeah. And then they don't like it again, they write it again. So by the time you get it, they've already gone through their process my process and the actor's process to a large extent is happening in front of witnessed by an entire crew. And so you need to do everything in your power to protect both of those processes so they feel safe. And that's sometimes difficult because a set is often chaotic. Uh, when you're doing really big shows, it's even more chaotic when there's, you know, 50 horses over there and 
special effects there and a green screen over there and a wind machine over there and there's 200 people on set and there's blood and there's moons and there's that's when you have to you know let the chaos exist but then when that set is handed to you focus and you need to center yourself and really see what's happening in front of you if you're trying to execute something that you prepped four months ago in your bedroom you're going to miss the moment yeah so it's a tricky balance and it's that's experience and it's um you know i learn every day i still learn every day on set i learn something new i'm like wow that's amazing or another you know crew member or somebody does something i'm like i've never seen that done that way like what and i'm curious so i go like why would you do that? And then they usually have a story behind it. You're like, oh my God, I'm putting that in the bank. Like that's another piece of info. No matter how long you work, you'll never, you'll never learn it all. Wow. Because it's collaborative. And so all those people bring their own point of view and all of their own experience. Yeah. And so, and I've, I've been blessed to work also um, all over the world. So, you know, from Kazakhstan to Malaysia to Cape Town, South Africa, to Budapest, to Prague, to Iceland, to Croatia, I mean, on and on, right? So I've worked with crews all over the world and, and I would call them filmmakers all over the world. And so you even learn just culturally, people do things differently and you pick up, you know, from everybody as a director, like I said, you're the colander, right? You're the spaghetti colander. It's like, you wanna get all that info in. Yeah. Your job isn't to be, bossy your job isn't to be powerful your job isn't to be any of those things your your job is to be a, a leader and you're and it's a really hard job and particularly in television because in tv you know the writer showrunner is really the king so i always explain like directing for television sometimes is like you're asked to come in and throw somebody else's Thanksgiving dinner and you don't know anybody in the family. So they don't tell you that, you know, Aunt Sally's a vegetarian. You learn that because you make a mistake and put your foot in it. So it's hard, it's a hard job. And ultimately you are there to add to uh, and bring your POV to a showrunner's POV. And that can be tricky because, you know, sometimes writers are really writers and not really filmmakers. And, and you might have more filmmaking ideas and you might have great visual ways of helping a writer realize what they're doing, but that writer might not be able to see it. So you have to negotiate those things and be willing. I always say as a director on television, um, you, you can go to the well twice. So if you have a great idea for a scene, you should bring it up to the showrunner. And if the showrunner kind of hears it and says, eh, I don't think so, you can go one more time. You can make one more pitch, but if they stay at that point, they still don't get it. Your job is to kind of let it go and come up with another one and know that you're good enough that you can come up with a hundred ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Trust your own ability as a director that you can uh, be in the moment, be free enough in the moment to come up with another solution because on a, you know, a lot of it's POV, right? But a lot of it is also problem solving, creative problem solving. And so you're always looking for a win, win, win. Like, can I deliver what the writer's doing? That's a win. Can I make it visually really interesting and add my POV to it that adds to the writer's POV? Mm -hmm. That's a win. Can I do it on time and on budget? That's a win. That's like a three win. You get a win, 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 you're home free. It's hard to get a win-win-win. Sometimes you get a win-win-lose. Sometimes you get a win-lose-lose. What you don't want is a lose-lose-lose. So, you know, that's part of the part of the um, the process. I think you have to assess the people you're working with, mm -hmm. how open they are to ideas, whether they just want you to execute what you know you look at past episodes if it's a show that's been around or, or the pilot or whatever to get a sense and you ask them about it like do you like close-ups do you mind if i just do minimal coverage and you know really do a great shot and a piece of coverage and they'll tell you they'll say no we really want options or they'll be like yes you know be strong be bold and if you have any questions about being bold just let me know ahead of time so that i'm aware 
So, you know, you, it, you learn how to negotiate your way through to protect both the story, protect the material for the showrunner and also protect yourself because um, it's very easy for people to throw the director under the bus. <laughs> Yeah. Because you're the guest. Mm -hmm. They're there forever. And if it goes great, it's because they're there forever. Mm -hmm. And if it goes bad, it's because you screwed it up. <laughs> I mean, that's sometimes, that's just, the, it's not, that's not to blame anyone. It's just the nature of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the nature of it. So you can, you can make that, you can do everything in your power to make sure that isn't the case by checking in, being honest, having the conversation. If you're gonna do something really radical that you haven't seen demonstrated stylistically in the show, you need to be honest about it and talk to the showrunner. Say, are you cool with this? Talk to the DP, you know, so that everybody's like, oh yeah, we know what's happening. We all think it's a good idea versus I'm gonna show up on the day and surprise them with my virtuistic filmmaking skill that they have no idea what I'm gonna do and hopefully they'll like it. That's the worst, you know, Share your information. Yeah. That doesn't mean you need to share your shot list. It means you need to share your concepts and, and understand what the scene is about and what are the moments in the scene that are important to the writer. Mm -hmm. And then protect those moments. As long as you protect those moments that they've brought up in the tone meeting or that you've talked to them about, you have a lot of latitude. Yeah. So see, this is, this is fantastic because uh, the beginner directors who are diving into that world of television, they don't know that this is how it works, that, that you, you have to listen to the vision of the showrunner because they think, hey, I'm the director. I'm running this world, but it's a little different here. And yeah, but even when you're doing a movie, you're not running the world. Okay. You know, you're not. It's a group effort. Listen, I come from theater, and so I always say the play is the thing. Mm -hmm. Right, so I approach the work in television, film, and anything that way. The material is the thing we serve. You don't serve me, you don't serve anyone, you serve the story and the material. And we all think about that and we all make that our boss. Exactly. That's our boss. And as long as you keep that clear, you're gonna have a better experience and you're gonna have a more collaborative experience and you'll end up with a better, a better final result, you know? If you're saying it's about me, then you've already twisted why you're all there. Yeah. You know, that's not what it's about. And, and so that's an important, you know, you keep, you keep fiddling with the car, like maybe it should be blue, maybe it should be red, maybe it should have no headlights, maybe it should have five headlights, you know? Should it have a leather interior, should it have a, you know, whatever those are all the decisions you're making to build the car and you know you don't know everything and you don't need to mm -hmm. you brought up showrunner and uh, that's a big difference between a director on a feature film and director on a tv show because showrunners run the world of tv shows so what is the good way for the director and showrunner to collaborate so the director can preserve his or her vision and still be respectful of the vision of the showrunner? Well, I think you need to start from understanding that, and I think it's really important, like the showrunner has the final say. Mm -hmm. So start there and let your ego know that because that's really important. That does not mean that you're not there to help uh, realize the showrunner's point of view. And I, I, I always say, I try to give the script a really deep reading. And then I kind of always have ideas like, do we really need this? Like it's helpful sometimes for a showrunner, for a director to say, I, you know, I can do this with her crossing across the room and shutting the window without the two pages of dialogue. Like it will, I can do that with the camera for you. And some will be like, oh my God, that's great because the script's too long. I, I get it, totally get it. Or they'll be like, no, I really want the dialogue. You go, okay, great. So you just keep, your job is to keep offering up possibilities. What if, what if we did this? What if we did this? And, and it's left brain and right brain. So there's the creative side, but there's also the, there's the other part that has a schedule to make and days to make. So if you have both sides of your brain 
you can find those win-wins I was talking about, right? Like you, you for example, you go to show and you say, listen, why don't, you know, we're already gonna be in the living room in this house. How about I take that scene that you wrote in the backyard, which we don't have on location, and I'll put that in the living room, which means we have more time to shoot. And now I can take the big moment that you wanna do the carnival and make it that much bigger. So you're, you're horse trading to some extent, creative horse trading to make the best thing you can do. So a showrunner is always gonna wanna know how to make it better. Like as long as you're trying to make what they're doing better. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to change what they're doing, you again, you can pitch that idea, but that's where you defer and you've gotta really defer. And I've seen young filmmakers make the mistake of, of really not wanting to buy the no, like, you know, and some showrunners, they don't want to say no. They want to say yes, but they really mean no. So that's tricky too. You got to kind of make it clear to them like, hey, I'm going to just pitch you ideas. Whatever you don't like, just tell me because it's fine. But I'm going to, as, as long as you're cool and you talk, you just talk like a human being. You ask them, you say, do you want my ideas? You know, you know, they'll be clear. They're like, no, I want this like this. And, and the bottom line is when you're brought in and you might only be doing two episodes or an episode, you don't under you don't know where the show's going. You don't know if that scene that you thought was completely useless, like why is it in the script, isn't setting up something for five episodes down the road that you don't have any idea about. So you have to always remember that their job is to keep the picture of the arc of the entire thing. And your arc of your one piece, one chapter of the novel isn't always aware of the whole novel. So when, when, when a showrunner says no, or I don't think that's such a great idea, you've got to remember that they're protecting the bigger, the bigger picture. So it's, you know, be a human, be honest. Mm -hmm. It's really the bottom line. Yeah, I be, guess. Honest, be honest. If you're not honest and you're playing games, then you're going to get caught. Yeah. And it's not the way to live your life. Absolutely. And again, going back to what you said about leaving the ego at the door, and knowing that you're there to carry across. Well, I will say it's hard because as a director, you do have to have an ego. You need to have a healthy ego. <laughs> That's important. You need to be able to, to believe in your ideas, advocate for your ideas passionately. And you also need to know that it's not the only idea. Mm -hmm. And you need to be open to saying, okay, I, I can hear five other ideas. I may still do the one that I originally started with, mm -hmm. but it's pretty surprising how many times you're like, that idea that somebody gave you might not work, but there's something in what they gave you that makes this idea better. You're like, I didn't like, I can't tell you how many times I've been like, oh, that's funny. They think my idea is communicating this. I thought my idea was communicating this. And now I know why, because of the, and sometimes it's stupid. It's like, because of the red shirt. They think it's connected to something. And you're like, the red shirt. I wasn't even thinking about the red shirt. So that's, you want to keep dialogue open so that you can, you know, you can learn. That's yeah. why editors are amazing too. That's why that's another part of the, that's another movie. Because once you're in there, it's like everything changes again. For the directors who are just starting out, uh, yeah. putting together some short films, uh, you know, just at the beginning of the path, submitting to film festivals, how do they get to the point of getting hired by TV shows? How do you how do you cross that? Just by submissions and getting recognized? It's just the wrong person to ask because I, mine was a crossover from direct having a... Yeah. Yours was a very unique path. <laughs> no, and I had a successful theater career, so I went right from directing theater to directing. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to doing this. I do believe though, if you're a director, you should direct. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big believer that you do something else to become a director. Mm -hmm. Like direct, like direct a two minute something, just keep directing stuff, mm -hmm. you know, just make stuff, make stuff on your iPhone, edit it together. Like the more you make, the more calling cards you have to get hired. Um, you know, it's even in my career, like even now, at the level on that, you know, I, I have people who say, well, we haven't ever seen him do that. 
So it's like, it doesn't change. It's not like it goes away magically someday. I have people go like, well, I does he do comedy. I don't know if he can do comedy. It's like, I did so much comedy, but this doesn't end. And so like I, for the first time in my life, like three years ago, I made a seven minute reel. I've never made a reel in my life. I haven't had to. I'm like, go watch some episodes. Yeah. But I was like, you know what? I need to make something because people don't sit and watch. Mm -hmm. So I made a, something that at least I can use as a kind of calling card to say, have them go, okay, this guy knows. Uh -huh. you know, it's doing and this is a little bit of his aesthetic yeah. so you never stop that side the business side of, of selling yourself but you want to sell yourself you don't want to sell some idea of yourself so again you have to be authentic be who you are you know if you're a photographer put together you know a, a lookbook of your photographs if you haven't made them it's like show people that you have a point of view, let them know that get back to POV again, that I was talking about. They wanna hire someone because they know you have a point of view. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the most important thing. And it can, you know, if you're a painter, show your paintings. Like it, it doesn't, I, I believe that people wanna work with creative people have something to say. Mm -hmm. I'm a pretty hands-on director because like I trained from camera with that first DP. So I have a lot of opinions about it and I set my shots. Like I actually set my shots. So I usually work really closely, you know, with the DP in, in prep, but then on set, I tend to spend most of my time with the camera operators and the DP in a more European style is dealing with the lighting and all of that. But then obviously blesses and oversees and makes sure, you know, and I'll say, we talk about it. I'm like, I think it should be a 40 and I think I kind of want to be here. And they'll say, well, maybe we should do this instead. And you're like, okay, it's better. It's just a collaboration, but it's still, you are the director. So your, your job is not to just say, but there are many kinds of directors, right? There are directors who only know how to direct actors, don't care about that. Mm -hmm. And the DP sets everything, mm -hmm. you know, picks every shot, sets the shot. Um, I tend to direct with an eye, with an eye toward the visual because of my background. So like, I know I'm not gonna put an actor against a wall. I'm gonna put an actor where there's a window that the DP can side light them and then I'll be on the dark side of the face. Like I know those kinds of things. So my staging with actors is already kind of visually telling the DP, it's communic everything you do communicates on set, right? Your blocking communicates something and so I don't really have, I mean, it's very easy for me with DPs because of that. Like, cause they sense that I know about light enough that I'm trying not to bone them. Or I also know when I am boning them, like I'll go up to them and say, I'm about to bone you just so you know, I'm aware that I put her under a door frame, but I don't know how to like, I can't move her out for this. And, and they're like, that's cool because at least you're acknowledging their issues that they have and different uh, DPs work different ways. Some light from outside of the space are very naturalistic. Some light everything and then crunch it down in the, you know, in the, um, uh, you know, when they get to it, they just crunch all the light down. So it doesn't look like it's overlit. So it's, I've worked with DPs who take light away. They don't add light. I've worked with DPs who add light. So they're as different as, a, as every director. And so it's important that you communicate your ideas to them. It's important that you have some conceptual conversation about it so that they can offer to you what their expertise is. Mm -hmm. um, and they're in the same boat. They have both the creative brain and then they have the left brain, you know, I got to make my day. How am I going to light this? We're over here. Do, you, know, we, we, you know, we don't have a lot of time. So they have a lot of problem solving ahead of time too. And then they try on the day, like you, to have done enough of that so that they can be inspired in the moment too by the actors, by the face of the actor. You know, whatever you plan, they don't know. An actor show up and have a totally different kind of face and it may require a different kind of lighting. You know, or we decide to put them in the dark. You're like, who knows? Like I was saying about the tree throwing a shadow, that, that's, that's the stuff you, you know, you are constantly conceptually talking to with the DP. Now, the bad thing about modern television and filmmaking now is that with digital, the DP is often color correcting this, 
you know, the shots as we go. So they're away in a dip tent with the DIT operator and you're somewhere else. So I used to sit next to my DP when we did film and you sat all day next to them and you'd be watching the monitor together and you'd say, you know, the DP would go, I don't really believe what she's doing. And you'd be, <laughs> really? You're like, yeah, I don't mind. I said, really? So like, it's not just about light. And not just about the shot, it's a collaborator who's telling you, like giving you another set of eyes about performance things that you might've been learned, like just lulled into thinking it was great. And they're going, mm, I don't buy it. Or they say, you know what? So I like that. And I miss having a DP with me when we're rolling. Um, and I would encourage directors, regardless of all the technology around it, to remember that, like sit with your DP have a dialogue about the entire movie. They're filmmakers. They're, they're a major, you're, they're your biggest collaborator on the set in some ways. So make sure you're listening to them. Make sure you're hearing what they're saying. Don't dismiss their ideas out of hand without trying to understand what the note behind the note is. Uh, now with the script, uh, when you get that script, and you start mm. to break it down into visions. <laughs> How yeah. does that process work for you? What inspires you? That's really an interesting How question because inspired? I've actually, that's an interesting question because I actually do a whole thing on that because it's, it's really important. The, when I was younger, I would read a script and I'd have a pen in my hand and I immediately get ideas mm -hmm. and I would write them down. I have since learned that it is imperative that I resist that urge. Hmm. My job is to, I read the script, I take no notes. I try not to get waylaid like, oh, I, what if I, what if I, I just read the script and then I put it down and then I don't think, I don't pick it up again. And then maybe the next day I'll read it again. And some thoughts will occur to me. I still won't write them down. And then I'll read it again. And then I'll start to take some notes on the script. Then I put it away again. Then I take it out. And then I check my notes. And I, I, because here's what, here's what I'm after. When you read a script for the first time, your collective experience of everything you've ever seen comes to bear on it. So you're going to, your brain is going to grab on to things it already knows. Oh, I know how to do that scene because that's like the scene, you're not, your brain isn't saying that, but it's going, that's the scene from Godfather, boom. And like, and so you've decided that that's, there's something you've decided about it, which is imitative yeah. because of your collective experience. So you want to resist the first decisions. You can write them down, but, but don't just feel like you've, checked it off the list. You need to go back and see like, am I, my first grab on isn't always instinctual. It's actually survival. It's, I gotta get this job done. Oh my God, I'm terrified. I know how to do it because right, that's how you do it. Versus is that really what the, like, you know, so, so that's something that I, try so like i you know i said to you like the that part of it is a whole different movie you know so you're constantly reassessing and checking in like am i being tricky am i tricking myself am i picking the easy road here is is this the right character's pov did i pick any character's pov or is it just omniscient storytelling pov should i have a stronger pov you know it's, it's evolved, it has to evolve. So I, I prep mostly by reading, leaving it alone, reading. Like if I showed you a script I'm doing now, there's like no notes in it. Like I don't take any notes anymore because I form by this kind of redrafting in the unconscious, I, I start to put the, put the movie, put the story in my DNA that I, I know the shape of the movie. And, and if it's good, you're not gonna, you don't need a note. You're gonna remember it. Yeah. Like, honestly, if you've hit something that's really strongly clear, you don't need to take a note. 
So I don't really take notes anymore. And then, but I remember, I remember what I need to remember, yeah. but I also forget what I need to forget. Uh, I, I just love how you put it this way that when you first think of it, it's a predictable reaction to the script. And that's something that viewers, when they watch it, they're gonna know, oh, that's, this is happening. And sometimes that's what you come back to. But yes, you have to be aware that your brain isn't in a um, quiet, creative, what if space. It's in a, I need to grab onto something because I don't have anything. Yeah. Oh, thank God, I know how to do that. I know how to do that. I know how to do that. And you're like, is that really the best choice? Yeah, yeah it's really important. That's something I've only learned like, later in my career because ultimately you want to be super instinctual you want to get to the point after a lot of process of of practice to you start to get really good at, at your job which is a job you never get great at as a director you can aspire to it but you get better and better is hopefully you get more instinctual you know like it, it becomes you see around the back of the fakeness you kind of start to question the easy choice you start to you start to hear a quiet little rumble inside that says yeah I, it's, not, I mean, it's fine it's fine but you're like do i really want to just do fine like and sometimes fine's all you can get to and that's fine too you know but but you know you want to keep asking yourself those questions the curiosity is the most important you know quality of being a good director i think to be super curious, curious about everything, you know, curious about how things work, how, why people behave the way they behave, what motivates people. And, you know, it's funny, like I always say for my acting, for my acting experience, it's like, there isn't a single character who does something because they think they're evil. Mm -hmm. They do it because they think they're doing the only thing available to them given the circumstances they're given an actor can't really play a negative action they can only play a positive action people don't go through life playing negative actions even the worst murder in the world in their own twisted logic in their mind believes they're doing what they have to do because society whatever so you know that like directing the actors is a whole other whole other part of it yeah. Miguela. You brought up directing actors. Oh, geez. Okay. This is, yeah, this is, this is a whole big thing and a whole separate topic. But actors, as you know, as an actor, are very sensitive about their work. So what is... Well, they're no the more director? sensitive or less sensitive than anybody else on the crew, believe me. The grip, Probably true. <laughs> the grip <laughs> you think is tough with his shorts on and cold weather is as sensitive as the actor, trust me. <laughs> Probably but, but you know, when it you is, get uh, upset and get out of character, it's much worse than, you know. Well, your job, your very first job as a director with actors is to make actors feel safe. Yes. So that uh, is... So an actor who feels safe is going to, to do somersaults for you. Mm -hmm. And if they know, you have to create an environment for an actor that they know that they can come and try and fail. Mm -hmm. They have to feel like they can fail. And when they do, and if they do, and they never really do, they just try something else. But in their mind, if they think they fail, they need to know that it's safe to fail. And they need to know that as a director, you're gonna be honest with them, compassionate and honest, and say, take them aside and not in front of the crew go, oh my God, what was that? You know, you pull them to the side and you say, hey, that was a great try. I think that was really, really interesting. and. Maybe we should, and they'll be, yeah, it didn't work, right? I'm like, well, you know, I wouldn't say it didn't work, but let's try something else. Like you want to continually help them. They have a horribly hard job. I mean, they have to be completely exposed in front of 200 strangers who someone's got a donut in their hand and, you know, somebody's not even paying attention to them. It's really hard. And so, you know, you are the one set of eyes that is there to reflect back to them, hopefully an honest assessment in a kind and compassionate way. Actors, the other thing is directors are too quick to direct actors. 
And you have to understand an actor spent just as much time thinking about the scene, you know, all those things that you have. So your job is not to give them one take and then jump in there and start redirecting everything they're doing. Your job is to just leave them alone for a little bit. Like the, the best editors are actors. If given their own, they will know after two or three takes, like mm, that's not working. And, and then they'll say, and then you can, then they're open to hearing you. Like knowing when to give an actor a note is super important. You give an actor a note too soon, that actor is, they're gone. You've lost them. They're like, you're not even interested in seeing what I'm doing. You're already telling me that I don't, I shouldn't bring anything to the table because I not even sat down and you've already told me how to do it. And actors don't need to be told the story of the scene either. That's not directing. They read the script, just like everybody else. You don't need to say, so what happens in this scene? It's like, they already know, they read it. They have a choice. What they wanna know is what am I playing? What do I, they wanna know their action. And, and they have an action, but they, they wanna make sure their action's correct. I, you know, what is my action with the other character in the scene? And what are my obstacles in the way of getting that? That's what you talk to an actor about. And then you also talk to an actor about size because, you know, the best actors in the world understand that I've worked with actors who say, what lens are we on? And you say, we're on a 40. They act differently for a 40 than they do to a 14. Because, you know, when you're in a super wide shot, you're really dealing with geography and physicality and are they walking out of the subway? You're seeing everything. When you're in here, you're, you're going for something different. So an actor's performance needs to be different for every size of lens you're on. And the great actors know that, you know, who've gone through enough experience, but a lot of the young actors don't, you need, you're there to help them. And that's one of the best things you can tell an actor is like, listen, you don't give the same performance from lens to lens. Like, let me help you. This is all about just your physicality. Like if someone has a really emotional scene and I'm on a 12 millimeter lens across the street, I'm like, I don't need you to be emotional in this scene. I just need to know where your body is in space, right? I need you to, I, I'm gonna, I need to see you cross from there to there. I can't see your face. There's like 5,000 people. Don't even worry about it yet. I'll tell you, you know, this is for a young actor, a uh, more experienced actor already knows this, right? But for a young actor, you wanna say, okay, now this is the shot where I need it because this is where I'm gonna be. This is the shot I'm going to be in. And it's the worst thing in the world from directors don't tell actors that because they're like, you might be in a medium shot and they think you're coming in for a close up. And then you do the medium shot and you go, great, check it, let's move on to the next scene. And they're like, what? I didn't know I wasn't coming in here. I would have given you more. So th that's the trust that you need to learn about the sensitivity of the actor on set so that you become partners in making this story um, and trust their instincts, you know, like at least see their instincts. They'll know if their instinct isn't working. What they might not know is that their instinct might be correct, but it doesn't work in the bigger storytelling of the movie. And that's, you know, that's sometimes where you have to, you know, be clear too, but you want to create a trust and give them space and you need to create quiet so that they can, you know, a chance to do their work. So it's a, it's a delicate balance because and you have to be a different director for every actor. Mm -hmm. Like I adjust how I direct depending on the actor. Some actors want to talk to you. Some actors want to be left alone. Some actor, I always say that every time I work with an actor, I work with every good and bad director they ever had. Mm. So I'm going to get projected onto me at the beginning, whatever their cumulative experience of working with directors is. If they've worked with a lot of abusive and bad directors, their immediate response to me is going to be suspicious, arm's length. So I, I can read that and I kind of leave them and I try to give them some space and try to encourage. And then I work with, you know, that's the thing you, you, you work, we all bring our, our entire experience to the table and you have to be sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole other part of the work. Question about actors who are just under five, maybe a couple of lines. What is the way for them to maybe be remembered or maybe 
have the director think of them next time. That's no, the, too long yeah. attitude already. Okay. The job is to come in and do the two lines. That's how you'll be remembered. Okay. So if no you way. Come in and you're trying to have the director remember you, even though you have two lines. You won't be remembered. Ah, okay. Well, at least that's honest. Thank you. <laughs> it's true. It's like people. You come in, you do your two lines, and you're easy to work with, and you don't take up more time than you need for the two lines. You get remembered. People okay. notice. Okay. I mean, you're, you, you, that, all that kind of like, how do I get noticed and be ahead as an actor? No. That's all night. Like, that's just all. Just keep on getting bigger roles and bigger roles and just, you know, just keep go showing through. up and yeah. being, you know, honest and pleasant and mm -hmm. appropriate time consumption to what your time is in the scene. All right, that's it. Say thank you. Say hi. How are you? And you know, and then leave and enjoy that you had a quick, easy day. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you get remembered, honestly. Okay. Now the burning question for the background actors, and they always ask that. Sure. Do you notice know background actors, and is there a chance for an upgrade, or it happens once in a million years, and not? No, really? it happens quite a bit. I mean, I think okay. um, it's a tricky thing, like. Uh, you know, because the director isn't really, we don't really deal with the background. Actors. We deal with it, what we see it in the frame. But, you know, it's the ADs who really deal with the background. They set the background, they talk to the background. I have lots of thoughts about the background. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, pull that one up. That one's like really great. Let's put them in front. Because mm -hmm. maybe because they look right. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the times the background stuff is a more visual mm -hmm. decision. And so background you know, artists really shouldn't take that personally or like if they move you from the front to the back, it's not because they don't like you. It's because they realize the 350 pound guy is going to be funnier up front for the scene you're doing or the, yeah. you know, or the leading lady has, you know, brunette hair and we don't want a brunette standing next to her. So it's like weird decisions like that that have nothing to do with ability or anything. So again, having a really open attitude about that and being helpful um, is really a good thing. Uh, but we, we notice background people. You, I tell you what, we notice when background people are trying are doing too much. <laughs> like the last thing you want to do is be noticed as a background person. You want to be not noticed. Then you're doing a great job. Fun stories <laughs> from <True. seven. laughs> You kind of don't want to be noticed. You want to be appropriate. You want to be appropriately in the scene you know, doing, you don't want to be trying to do too much. That's how you get like not in the shot. I so. always remember the scene from Friends when Monica and Ross are dancing in that New Year thing. <laughs> Directors don't get that much time in the editing room. So how do you- Who doesn't? Uh, TV, TV directors, am, right. I, am I right? They, they, That's correct. Well, usually on an hour long, you get four days to do yes. your cut. Yes. So the editor cuts behind you, they hand you a cut, mm -hmm. the editor's cut, and then I get four days in the editing room to cut the editor's cut. Mm -hmm. Then I hand in my cut, then the showrunner gets four days to do their cut. Okay. <laughs> then the showrunner's cut goes to the studio. The uh -huh. studio gets to give notes and it gets a studio cut. Then it goes to the network and then the network does their cut. So what you see is often three or four cuts away from the director's cut. Mm -hmm. Now, that used to be really, uh, it used to be really different back in the day. It's not so much now because as, as television has become more like film and the demands on television are as great as film. We're asked to do friggin', you know, 50, $60 million movies each week now. They don't, there's no excuse like, so what? You want, there's gonna be 50 horses. You're like, okay, it's a television show. So now the director's role in TV has actually increased mm -hmm. because of what's required and what's expected. And the line between cinema and television is gone. And this pandemic has made that even more clear. So now movies are released on streaming and now movie theaters themselves, who knows what's gonna be the fate of them. So this whole, even calling something a movie or a television 
it, it's the wrong definition now. There's just storytelling. And it's either long form storytelling or short form storytelling. That's it. So there's very little difference. And I see that becoming even more blurred. So nowadays, the role of the director is coming up in the world to, with the showrunner on television. It's like so many of the shows require such directing skill that, you know, we are asked to do more and more. So it's a little different. So when you deliver your cut, I would say more so nowadays than before, it's, it's, it's respected a little bit more. And actually the higher the, the situation, the more they kind of tend to respect you as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like on HBO, they were very respectful of the filmmaker's cut, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's it just depends. stressful knowing that you only have four days and you have to make those major decisions. And but your editor has given you something to respond to. Yeah. So the editor, you know, is giving you something. Now, if you get a great editor's cut, you're like, oh my God, this is awesome, right? Sometimes you don't because, you know, it depends on how you shoot. And this is another thing. So like, remember I was talking about there's people who are film collectors and people who are directors with a strong POV. Mm -hmm. If you're direct with a strong POV, the editor pretty much knows how to assemble your scene. If you give an editor 29 options for every moment, you don't know what you're gonna get. The editor can make 29 different movies. So you've, and, and there's a fine line between giving yourself enough footage so you and the team have enough options available to you to do some rewriting in the editing room. That's a good thing. But there's also something to be said for editing and camera that you're not providing certain footage so that the scene will pretty much be in the zone you saw it. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen directors go too far and too early in their career and they edit in the camera. Like there are no options. Yeah. There's like that and that. And then the showrunner gets in and goes, well, I want to cut to her. And they're like, they didn't shoot it. That doesn't go over well. So you have to kind of be aware of providing a couple options while maintaining your your point of view. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, Because it's not your movie. Mm -hmm. Decision making. And that's a tough one. Decision. Because you have to make a lot of decisions about the scene and the things change right on set that you have you to You can't obsess over it because there's a hundred ways to do it. So okay. not every decision requires the same attention. Not as a director, you're asked a hundred thousand questions a day. Do you like this pair of shoes or that pair of shoes? I go, what pair of shoes do you like? This one, I go, great. Because it doesn't matter to me. It's not integral to the thing. So I'd rather trust the designer who thinks about the shoes 24 hours a day and say, which one do you like? And they go, well, I prefer these. And you go, great, because it's not worth the time when you're, you're not thinking about those shoes the way they are. They're actually researching those shoes and thinking, well, these shoes will be good because the other character is wearing these shoes. And this kind of reveals character in this way. And it's like, you have to give some trust to people. So that frees you up to make the real decisions like, can we make this scene, you know, day instead of night? <laughs> Can we, you know, those are, those are the bigger decisions you need to be kind of thinking about. And do we need, does this actor need to be here all day? Like, oh, there's a hundred decisions that you need. Every decision has a different priority. So not every decision should be given equal weight. Trust your collaborators to make, they're there to help because the play is the thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And how do you deal with cognitive dissonance of the important decisions? Say that again? How do you deal with cognitive dissonance that the company is important decisions? Well, that's tricky. I mean, um, you, I don't know how to answer that without a specific example because it's... Um, you have something to share that uh, you're allowed to share? <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of something like that. Um, Again, I think I would say that if you can work toward a win-win-win, mm -hmm. that should be your focal focus. People 
don't focus that way. They focus on, but I, but I, but I, but I, but I, and it's like, no, focus on what is really important to you. Pick your moments. You know, not every moment is equally important. And if a producer, showrunner, DP, if every, if every decision you make that is life and death, they're going to stop believing when it's life and death. Mm -hmm. So then you, they have no way to judge when you're serious. So you need to, and then if you, if you are having cognitive dissonance on a big issue and it is really important to you, you're going to have a better chance because you didn't make everything that important. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it. Like, you know, you got to show some flexibility. You got to give a little and you get a little and you give a little. It's a, the art of uh, negotiating the deal, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And that fantastic formula, the, the three yeses. It's if you can get those, you're great. You want to shoot for that always. Because it, what it does is it, it makes you think about the other two parts that need a yes to. So if, if, you, if you come in and say, I don't need to care about any else but my yes, my win, then you're going to get in trouble. But if you're always approaching it from, can we get an, an answer that gives us a, and sometimes you can't, sometimes it's just going to be the one you need. And that's when you have to kind of passionately, reasonably explain why and say, what can we do to protect this? Because this is really important to me. What can I give up to get this? That's the attitude you have to have. Like, and you have to be creative and say, listen, if I got rid of the carnival scene, which is hard for me because I love the carnival scene, but if I give that up, can I get this? Because this is more important to me. And people understand that and they'll you know, work with you. But it is your right as a director to ask your producer or your line producer to provide you with options. Their job is not to say no. And a lot of times when it gets into ego, they believe their job is to say no. Their job is to say, how can we do that? Let's see what the options are. If you want that, you have to either give up this, this, and this. Their job isn't to tell you no. Their job is to facilitate options to help you make the decisions clearly so that the priorities are clear for you and your storytelling. That's important too. I mean, you need to talk to producers about that because that's their, their responsibility. My responsibility is to look for win-win-wins that includes them, but their responsibility is to also look for win-win-wins that include me. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's a, it's a collaborative form that way. Yeah. There's a lot of jobs being a director. <laughs> It is. And your job is to be pretty good at all of them. Your job is, you know, you're not going to be right away. But again, that's being humble enough to realize where you need to improve. I've had to improve like, on, oh my God, early on, I was, I was insensitive to crew, like, you know, in a way that I really had to learn. Like I had to learn like, hey, these people are giving up their whole lives too. They don't get to go home to their kids or their family and they're here and, and they, they don't get any of the glory. You know, the guys who are moving the lights around, the guys who, they don't get any glory. They just don't get to be with their family, right? So you got to be sensitive to it. You got to try to understand that um, if you can, you know, organize your day to get out an hour early, it means that guy gets to go home and, um, you know, read a book to his three-year-old before they go to bed. That's important. That's as important as making the movie. So you're, you're a captain in that way, in that you got to be sensitive to all of it. And you're like, oh, if I just, if I get three more shots that you know you don't need, that's going to keep everybody there for another hour and a half, you got to decide if it's the kind of day that you can do that, or you got to read the temperature of the room and say, I think I can let go. I don't need this shot. And it's going to be better if everybody goes home and gets an extra hour and they'll come in tomorrow when I know we have a really hard day and they'll be in better uh, spirits than if I keep them and they're miserable and then they come in the next day and have a hard day and it's going to be harder. So that's a whole other read that you have to do. Yeah, so a lot of people skills, a lot of psychology behind it. Every it's an impossible job, but it's a really fun job, you know, if you get honored with being able to 
it's a lot that people are uh, trusting you and um listen we all make mistakes we all forget it no one's perfect um i i've done things that i wish i could you know take back and I've, but i but i try to learn from them i try to remember them i try to you know the next time be aware of it it's a very pressure based job and you have to learn how to not let the pressure you, Early on, I would pass the pressure on to other people. The pressure that I was feeling, you know, it's kind of like it just keeps rolling downhill. You realize there's no other, it, this is the only hill. Like, you know, so like there's a, there's a, um, a little Buddhist cogent that I like to remember when I, every day I direct. And I say to myself, you know, right before I go, and I say, be the mountain, not the weather. Right. No matter how crazy the weather careens across the surface of the mountain, be the mountain, not the weather. Now, I might fail five minutes into the day, <laughs> but I can come back to it. Every day is a new day. Like I can, I have days where I just completely am the weather. And that's just not a great day. Yeah, right? You're human. right. Yeah. But you want to always reset. Right. And, and the thing about a film set, too, is you get to reset all the time. You get to reset and you want to keep resetting to that place of like mm -hmm. work together and try to you know do something that we're all proud of you do the work and work will come mm -hmm. don't work on trying to get the work just yeah. do work yeah. make things make things make things make things make things mm -hmm. so when somebody says great but what have you do you have anything to show me and you're like no well, there's eight other people who do. Yeah. And, you know, you don't have to make things and go broke. You can make a two minute film and then a three minute film and, you know, mm -hmm. something that has a unique point of view that shows off who you are. Um, you don't have to, you know, get five credit cards and go into a million dollar debt. You don't, have to, you, don't have to, you don't have to do that. So, I mean, I came from nothing, so I don't know what that route, like I never, mm -hmm. There are people who get into this business who are blessed with a lot of money and they just make, a, you know, they spend $3 million and make a movie. And you're like, wow, lucky you. <laughs> but that's not my, my path. No, your path is very fascinating. And that's why we love inviting people from different paths because everybody can find inspiration in, in that road. In that yeah. Journey. So yeah, I think you have to. I think that's about being authentic to yourself. Mm -hmm and not being afraid of taking the, a choice that, you know, you don't know where it's gonna lead you. Like, you know, and, and you might think you wanna be a director and you might learn you wanna be a DP or you might think you wanna be a director and learn that you're a writer. You wanna be a director and end up being a producer, like, or a makeup person, you don't know. If you, you, your love of wanting to be in the business may be greater than you know, being true to yourself is learning where, where your interest is. And that can change over time. Like I had a theater career. I never in a million years thought I'd be doing this. And then I had a second career. And now at my age, I'm thinking about what my third career should be. Nice. Because we change. And, you know, I don't, it, it's, if you're looking at it as just a job, then I think you're going to have a hard time. If you're looking at, I have these things I want to say and these stories I want to tell, and what's my best way to, you know, help do that? Then I think you're on the right path, and and things will happen. You know, things will come your way. Mm -hmm. And volunteer, you know, volunteer to help people. Call people up and say, hey, you know, I'd love to be involved. There's something I can do. You know, and there's also observerships. That's a good way. Mm -hmm. A lot of these places have, you know. Uh, observership possibilities for young directors too. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of opportunity right now also for diversity directors. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, an, that's really encouraging. There's a lot of programs for, you know, geared toward finding opportunities to try to level the playing field a little bit. And that's really great. So, you know, if you're not like me, a white guy, <laughs> Come on in. There's a lot of opportunities. I mean, you two white guys. I don't want to put you down, but you know what I mean. I, I think, as having been blessed with probably more opportunity than probably was warranted, yeah. 
um, we are trying to level that playing field. And there's a lot of opportunities for women and diversity. And look for those programs. I mean, just Google online about director observerships. There's Actually, now that you brought it up, and this Universal does this fantastic Writers on the Verge. And you, the AFI does. There's yeah. tons. Almost all the major networks do now. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely. There's a lot of great opportunities for people to get in the door. And if anything, if nothing else, it allows you to see if it's something you really want to do. Because it's, it, 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 may, it sometimes seems really awesome from the outside. It's hard work and you give up a lot. You know, I've missed weddings, funerals, births. I've missed holidays. Yeah. You know, you, you, you give up a lot and people don't talk about that part of it. And you... Sometimes, you know, you end up, there are definitely days where I wake up and I go, hmm, was it worth all that? So, you know, that's an important thing to ask early on if you really are serious about it because you're blinded by your passion when you're young. But you got to be aware of what the sacrifices are. Yeah. I think that's important too. Yeah. And, and, and if the answer is still yes, great. Like for me, the answer is still yeah. yes. You know. And like you said, you keep discovering yourself. So if this is something you love right now, then definitely you, you have time and energy and put it put your time and energy really? into this. But know that there are other things you can also do, even in the same industry, just maybe like absolutely you said, that's the thing. You can be involved in other ways. And then three years of that will lead you to maybe some other way of being involved. You, you know, don't think you just have to come in and be a director because mm -hmm. it's the odds are not in your favor. <laughs> They're just not. There's only one of those on each project. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> There's 450 other people who are doing really good, making a good living and enjoy being on set. <laughs> that is true. Thank you for having me. I am a big fan of shooting in uh, Pennsylvania. Oh, that's great. That's good to I've hear. shot in Philadelphia and I've shot in Pittsburgh and they're two of my favorite places to shoot. Pittsburgh in particular is uh, an amazing place to shoot with an amazing crew. One of the favorite crews I've worked with, like a really great tight knit community in Pittsburgh and film of filmmakers that I love to this day. I still talk to a lot of them. And, you know, I would say people, I don't think everyone in the business understands that Pittsburgh is like an amazing backlog. It has everything. I mean, from downtown that looks like a, you know, you could do period New York and within 10 minutes you're in the countryside and 10 minutes you're in, you know, a steel mill. It's an amazing, amazing place. And the people who work in the, in the film uh, business in Pittsburgh are some of my favorite people. So yeah. <laughs> it's a pleasure to, to talk to you. And I've always been grateful to, to Pennsylvania. I, I exec produced the series and Pittsburgh, uh, Those Who Kill with Chloe Sevigny, James Darcy, and, and spent the year in Pittsburgh and, and just fell in love with that. And you have great restaurants too. So. Yes, <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you for your kind words. We hope that you're going to come back and film in Pennsylvania. We, we... Well, I hope the Pennsylvania legislation gives you a better and better film rebate. And yes, a, thank and you a, for and a permanent that. one, and a permanent one that doesn't mean yes. film companies make plans and then have to cancel them. They need, to, they need to make a long-term commitment, mm -hmm. five years at a time so that people can plan projects and it needs to have no cap on it. And they need to, to be able to, they will reap huge benefits for the people of Pennsylvania if they do that. And I'll tell you, the, the industry loves to film in Pennsylvania and the only issue about it has been the, uncertainty of the rebate situation so come on <laughs> we're working on it <laughs> that is a big mission of ours is to preserve increase and hopefully uncap the film tax credits so that filmmakers right. like you can bless us <laughs> with beautiful movies with award-winning tv shows so with opportunities for all your young filmmakers to get into the business at home and not have to leave but you know, it would be great. That, that, that will really give you a boost for the people who are, you know, hopefully watching to, to get out and be active and for them to write their representatives there and say, hey, we need this here. This will create a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, economic stimulus for us and opportunities 
You know, it's the one last industry in America that is a growth industry, mm -hmm. entertainment. Indeed, indeed. And so many other industries benefit from the film industry. Oh. In the state. So exactly. absolutely. Well, thank you so much. You, you shared so many interesting perspectives on filmmaking and not just on directing, just on many different, uh, different parts of this industry. So we're truly grateful. Thank you for your guidance. For having me, appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Good luck to everybody there. Yay, good luck everyone. We hope to see your films on the big screen and TV shows on the top streaming platforms. So good luck everyone. Thank you. Thank you.